So I would like to begin by honoring and acknowledging the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and now is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First Peoples of this land. In this virtual space, we are all convening from different places. This is one of the things that makes the online environment so special. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. Hi everyone, welcome to eCampus Ontario's virtual test week. We are so excited to be offering uh, this last webinar in the series of three webinars we did leading up to tests. My name is Lofia Dalla, and I'm part of the communications team at eCampus Ontario, where I primarily work on events. The Technology and Education Seminar and Showcase uh, TESS has been around um, since 2015 and is eCampus Ontario's annual flagship event. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, welcome. TESS brings together the community to share, learn, and celebrate as we shape the future of learning together. This year's theme, The Hybrid Experience, Designing the Future of Learning, explores the evolution of an integrated digital and in-person education environment, the future of delivering vibrant learning experiences, and the steps we take to today for a more effective and sustainable tomorrow. This year, we have three different tracks, Imagining Digital Futures, Digital Inclusion, and Practices and Pedagogies. Today's webinar is about the positive effects of open source, uh, open resource assessment on student learning approaches and outcomes across multiple course modalities. It gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar and to introduce you to our main pre presenters, Ryan Carboni and Dr. Shannon Dowdell-Smith from Cabrian University College. Um, I'd like to hand it over to you now. Thank you so much for the introduction, Lutfia. As Lutfia said, my name is Ryan. I am a professor at Cambrian College where I teach science courses related to disease to both the practical nursing and RN programs at our site. And hi there, I'm Shannon. Um, I teach in the Bachelor of Science in Nursing program here at Cambrian College and coordinate the new standalone program um, that we just started this fall. So welcome, everybody. Yes, thank you for coming. And I just would like to add uh, one small note that uh, I, there was a comment made before, I think, Lutfia, you had mentioned that the PowerPoint slide deck was available for participants to have access to. We've made a couple changes since the last version that we sent you, but we can provide you with this one once the presentation is over today so it can be disseminated. Perfect. Thank you. All right, let's begin. Thank you, everyone, for taking interest in our topic that we'll be presenting about today. We are very excited to share the data that we have that we've accumulated over the last few years with respect to open resource testing. We'll just begin by going over some very broad learning outcomes for what we are going to be going through together today. The first thing that we will like to highlight is the, the data that we have and the creation of open resource questions will demonstrate how we can force students into the development of higher order thinking skills. The second outcome is to differentiate for those of you online, um, some of the different choices and parameters that we've set uh, for open resource assessment. And um, just before Ryan goes on with objective three, just wanted to clarify because I know um, open access resources are really hot right now, and we also call them OERs. Um, so this not to be confused with OERs, um, textbooks that you, you can uh, get as open access. Um, this is um, open resource, and Ryan will clarify that even further in a little bit. Thanks, Shannon. Something else we'd like to present today as well is Another hot topic that's been happening uh, over education over the last few years, especially with the transitioning to remote teaching and learning, would be the subject of academic integrity and how we can promote that through the creation of authentic assessments. 
And finally, um, we're going to break down and compare some of that distribution of grades, um, looking at uh, closed book or closed resource versus open book, open resource. Um, uh, Ryan has some great data where he um, has uh, compared both methodologies. Thanks, Shannon. The first thing we'd like to address is what we mean exactly by open resource. And I know Shannon has already dispelled perhaps another use of the term open resource. So we'll just give you some examples with some icons here on our slideshow. By open resource, we are looking at assessments that students can complete whereby they have access to resources <clears throat> where they can tap into to help them answer questions that are posed to them. So these will include things like a hardcover textbook, an ebook, or an open educational resource, which Shannon has already alluded to previously. They can have open notes, so any notes that they've taken during their lectures for their theory-based classes, they can have at their disposal. In addition, we will show data that we have from assessments that were done with open web access, meaning they had free access to web browsers without any type of lockdown browser incorporated to block access to search engines like Google or any other type of resource. And as well, sometimes students were given open access to their LMS, which can also contain a, a bevy of supplies and materials that they can use to help them answer questions that they have on an assessment. And the idea behind open web, of course, was in the digital age of education that we're in now, a lot of students do purchase ebooks, not only for cost effectiveness, but because they can keep all of their textbooks on one device. So allowing them open web access also continues to allow them to access those resources that they've purchased and that they are using. Okay. So open resource testing um, within the concept of authentic testing um, allows us to assess, and I'm talking about this, of course, from my bias as a nurse educator. So a lot of my experience, well, actually all of my experience, is that of nursing um, undergraduate level curriculum. Um, Ryan will give you a little bit of um, a taste of, of a science uh, lens. But in authentic testing and open resource testing, we see that we're able to assess application of theory. So it's not just uh, rote memorization or regurgitation of fact, it's more assessing the application of theory. Um, what we use and, and what is excellent for any really uh, applied health um, curriculum would be scenario-based question. So it allows you to base testing or assignments in the doing of what you're teaching. Um, enhances the requirement for the students to demonstrate judgment, clinical judgment, and critical thinking. Uh, as I mentioned, relevant for multiple contexts and multiple courses, um, you could easily use this type of authentic testing in any discipline but really, really effective for a, a health-based discipline. And of course, um, offers flexible design options, which we'll get into in a little bit. While academic integrity has always been important, I would probably say <clears throat> most educators would agree that over the last few years of virtual teaching and learning, academic integrity has become a very hot topic with respect to advances in education. And open resource testing lends itself really well to promoting and encouraging academic integrity as a lot of literature demonstrates that when presented with this type of assessment, students will tend to place higher value on what they're actually learning versus the specific grade that they're going to earn. <clears throat> Pardon me. Because of that, there's a motivation for them that comes from within. It's an intrinsic motivation where they view the assessments as a challenge in order to better themselves from their previous assessment that they've done as a course progresses. Because of that motivation that comes from within, when students are motivated to do better than their last assessment to meet the bar of a particular course, it also builds their confidence because over time, when they see an improvement in their performance, 
it reiterates to them and reinforces to them that they are developing a deep understanding of the subject matter that they're being assessed on, not strictly from a knowledge base, but also more imp most importantly above anything else, it's the application piece that we're after. Because there is less of a dependence on lower level blooms type verbs, like recall, identify, state, name, students are pushed towards higher levels of the Bloom cognitive scale. <clears throat> and with that reduction in the need to memorize and perhaps reduce cramming before a test, students have a bit more of a relaxed approach to an open book test because they don't need to spend all of that time cramming and forcing that recall in because they know that if they do need to fall back on basic recall, they can quickly look it up during an open resource type of assessment. Going hand in hand with accessing higher levels of the Bloom scale for cognitive difficulty, this also allows us to tap into the different question types and diverse question types that are available within the LMS that we have. At Cambrian, our LMS is Moodle, and there are a lot of question types that we can access through that particular platform, which we'll show you a couple examples of those right now. On my slideshow, on this particular slide right here, you can see just a small subset of the question types that Shannon and I have accessed when creating our tests, including things from short answer, matching. The embedded answers or closed type can be very useful for unfolding case studies, drag and drop onto text or different images. Ordering questions I find always will push students to higher level orders of Bloom's taxonomy just by virtue of the uh, having to gain the ability to distinguish between different pieces of information and then arrange the parts accordingly. I've decided to include one example of how I have taken a traditional closed resource test question and put a different spin on it to make it more suitable for an open resource type test. So my primary teaching roles at the college are, as I mentioned in the intro, I teach science courses that are related to disease. So I've pulled questions from the subject matter that I deliver regularly. This question here states, which electrolyte imbalance would a nurse anticipate in a client with renal failure? This type of question here, you have, it's multiple choice. There are four options to choose from. Definitely more suited to a closed book type of assessment where it focuses more on the recall. In spinning this to create it to lend itself better to an open resource style of test, I've taken that question and created it as a select all that apply, where the student reading the question will have to go through each of the five clients that are presented to them, think about the underlying disease process that each of them experiences, and from there, then have a way to predict whether or not this client will be at risk of having hypokalemia, which just means a low blood level of potassium. But when they are applying that pathophysiological knowledge, they take the theory, they apply it, they can then systematically go through each option and critically think about each. And that's the key behind all of this. The, the critical thinking aspect is what drives that higher order thinking. So this is an example, just one example of how a closed resource type test question can be transformed into one that's more suitable for open resource. This is what the type of transformation I've done for the science-based courses that I teach, which do support nursing. And I'll turn over to Shannon now because she will show you some examples of her style of test question transformation. Okay, so here I've included an example of a, a closed resource test question. Again, a multiple choice question. And, and those of you familiar with nursing curriculum will know multiple choice is, is a lot of, of how we evaluate, primarily because of the national um, uh, board exam. Um, but in this case, uh, which statement best describes the purpose of a problem statement in qualitative research? We have the answer is just one choice of the multiple choice um, uh, list of the multiple choice options. So as I teach research, um, I've um, changed that type of question. And um, Ryan will click my animation. 
<laughs> As an example of an open, open resource test question, I can have a similar, um, similar question, and that would be discuss the clinical problem and the purpose of the study in the assigned peer-reviewed article. So in this case, um, how I tested the students in a nursing research course was to um, give them a selection of questions um, and based on a um, research article that I handed them at the beginning of the class, beginning of the test time period, um, they were to answer those questions um, using that uh, research uh, study that I gave them the article uh, about. So in this case, um, the student answering such a question demonstrates their ability to um, um, apply their knowledge and to interpret what the study author has written in the article, demonstrating a higher order thinking. We'd now like to show you some data that we've collected from assessments that we have graded from courses over the last few years. We're gonna present two different approaches today. Approach number one, will focus on assessments that are open resource, unproctored, and time limited. Often I get asked why I chose to start using open resource assessments when we made the switch to virtual teaching and learning. And to be quite honest, uh, the, the reason why I did that is because I thought that whether I liked it or not, my tests were going to be open book. So I thought if I can't beat them, I might as well join them and try and make the best out of what I had at my disposal. Here is one example that I have taken from one of my pathophysiology courses that I teach. This is the grade distribution for a test on an open resource, unproctored, time-limited test. The class average was a respectable 74%. You can see one of the things that's most obvious to me when I look at this is I don't see a major skew towards very high grades or very low grades. Uh, you can see on the camera right now that we disappeared briefly because Shannon and I are in a room on campus and if you don't move enough, the lights will automatically shut off. So it looks like we're doing a little bit of a Blair Witch thing right now, but I promise you that's not what our intention is. This particular slide right here is a correlational study that I did. Thank you, Shannon, for hitting the light switch. There we go, a little bit of movement will definitely help us help us out with that. This is a correlational study that I did. So this is a graph that is trying to depict the relationship between final grade distribution in my pathophysiology course, which I assessed open resource, unproctored, and they are correlated with grades from a nursing theory course where the students were assessed closed style and proctored. Nursing theory is a course that is very closely tied to pathophysiology. So in short, pathophysiology goes through disease mechanisms. Nursing theory is where students learn the interventions that will assist clients at various states of a disease process. Now, a couple of red lines have shown up here. Those red lines demarcate where the passing grades are. So a pass is 60 in pathophysiology. A pass is also 60 in nursing theory. When you look at the plots, the scatter plot that we have with all the black dots, there's an 82% correlation between student grades, which is quite significant with respect to them completing their assessments open resource in my course and closed resource in another course, which closely follows mine. This data was very encouraging to me because it definitely showed consistency with respect to student performance on assessments in both courses. The class average for both also very close. Pathophysiology came in at 73%, while the nursing theory course came in at 71. Okay, so here's also an example using that same approach of unproctored and time limited. This is um, an open access, um, open resource test from a nursing leadership course. So the test was on uh, nursing leadership management styles and theories. You'll see here, um, with the exception of my one outlier, um, pretty, uh, pretty normal looking curve and a class average of 84%. Um, the next one, I'm gonna show you uh, same class, 
um, a few weeks later into the semester. And you'll see the average dropped quite a bit. And I'll tell you the variable here that I changed was the time. So after the first test, that was quite a high average, 84, uh, for a, a nursing course. And when I talk to the students after the test, um, there was a lot of, oh, that was too easy. We had too much time. Um, it was, you know, way too easy, Shannon. So when the next test came along, um, made the questions a little bit harder. And instead of a three hour test, I gave them two hours for the test. So, I mean, that opens a whole other can of worms and we could do a whole other session on Mm -hmm. on the variables involved um, and how changing them can impact outcomes. Um, but just to know that that's why there is a, a quite a, a change in the, in the class average. The next type of data I'd like to present still under approach number one, open resource, unproctored, time limited, is some year over year data that I've collected over the last three years for a different course that I teach. This time, the course that I've selected is called Clinical Chemistry. It is a course where students, very similar to pathophysiology in a way, will learn how to interpret lab work. So they learn how to interpret blood tests, urinalysis, those sorts of tests, and they relate them to the disease process. This delivery of Clinical Chemistry was virtual. It was synchronous. This is from fall of 2020. This is the grade distribution for a case study assignment. The class average was a respectable 75%, more or less on target for what I would usually see for the equivalent closed type assessment for this subject matter. And then a year later, the modality of my course changed. It was still virtual, but it was hybrid. Same case study assignment based on the same disease process. Average was now 71%, so similar enough to the first one. And this particular spread of results here has more of an obvious bell shape to it, which was very interesting to me. And then from this fall, now that restrictions have been lifted, we're back in face-to-face -face teaching. This is the same case study assignment from the previous two iterations of data that I've shown. Average has dropped significantly from the initial one in 2020 down to an average of about 66. And the distribution of grades on this one doesn't really have a typical shape to it. Um, there are some extremely lower grades on this one, but one thing to keep in mind that this, this was still open resource, it was unproctored and time limited. It's just that the theory component was delivered in a face-to-face -face manner. So the students were still completing this asynchronously on their own without being proctored and the difference in class average and the difference in grade distribution here, there are certain reasons that contribute to that. And there are many factors like Shannon was saying before that can factor into this, including cohort strength. And those are things that we'll be happy to address in the Q and A's at the end. For the second approach, so today we're showing two approaches. The only difference between Approach number one and approach number two is what you see colored in purple at the very top. So we are now looking at assessments which are open book, proctored now because they're happening on site in a classroom and they are still time limited. So Shannon, I'll let you jump in here. Okay, so this is some very fresh off the press data. Um, this is a course that I'm currently teaching this semester. Uh, this was a test earlier on in the semester. Um, and this was the test that I um, took the example of the question from. So um, the students were given a list of questions several weeks before the test. And uh, the students were given, um, I posted five different um, research articles, all based on the same topic, which was uh, uh, fungating wounds, which is a, a, a cancer wound. Um, Ryan's sighing over here, but it's just the nursing thing I do. Um, so why I chose to do it that way was I was teaching them um, a rapid review methodology, which is a type of systematic review. And what I wanted them to kind of uh, get a taste of was seeing um, a collection of research study articles all in that same 
um, uh, concept or, or context of treatment of a fungating wound. So they were given research questions ahead of time. They were given um, the research articles ahead of time. And then the morning of the test, they came in. It was a test um, in person. So I was there to proctor. It was time limited. And uh, as they came in, they were given um, either electronically or in, in person in a hard copy of that research study. And they were asked to answer 10 questions out of the list of questions that I had provided. Um, you can see here um, that the class average was 78%. This is the data that I've chosen to show for approach number two. So again, that's open resource proctored and time limited. With the lifting of restrictions that happened fully at Cambrian College in the spring semester here, I had the ability, pardon me, to teach my pathophysiology course, well, one of them, face-to-face -face in the spring for the first time in a couple of years. So what I'm presenting on my slide right now is the final grade distribution for the spring or face-to-face -face delivery of my course side-by-side -side with the winter previous delivery, so the semester right before that. So winter is, this was winter of 2022 and spring of 2022. This is very fresh data that I've just collected. You can see that the class averages for both were very similar, 70 and a half for the spring cohort and 71.2 for the winter. Now, the bars in blue, those represent the winter delivery, which was virtual. The bars in the gold color represent the spring delivery, which was face-to-face. -face. And you can see a very similar distribution of grades between the two as a function of modality. So the modality may have had some impacts on grades, but there is no glaring major difference between the two. Again, I am encouraged by the use of open resource testing and not a major skew towards very high grades or a major skew to very, very low grades. And I think that's the one of the major points that Shannon and I are trying to illustrate throughout our presentation today and the different approaches that we have both taken towards open resource testing. Okay, so uh, following the uh, open resource um, research test this semester, um, I had a bit of a Q&A session afterwards, very informal. Um, we just kind of had a chat about what they liked about it. And uh, these were the, the questions that I put up at the front of the class. Um, and Ryan, Ryan, if you'll go to the next slide, I'll show you some of the feedback that I did receive from students this very semester. Um, one of the major themes that came out of this was a stress reduction. So they felt a lot less anxiety, um, knowing that uh, if they knew where to find the answer, they could find the answer. Um, if they feel like expectations are higher for their learning, and they're able to demonstrate a higher level of learning by um, finding the information, applying the information, interpreting um, the studies they've read and demonstrating to me um, that they understand the concepts and are able to apply the concepts and interpret what the author of the study has written. Um, what was big part of the um, anxiety re reduction was falling back on their notes or um, the ability to look something look, look something up in their class textbook or online if that test anxiety um, increased while they were writing the test. Um, this is a, a huge um, concept in nursing, and that is we try to graduate nurses at the end of four years with this Bachelor of Science uh, um, degree in nursing, but we can't possibly teach them everything they need to know to be a fabulous and competent and um, um, current nurse. Um, so what we try to do uh, as nursing educators is to teach them how to think critically and how to find the answers rather than teaching them all of the answers. And I think that sort of it goes across the board for, for anyone who's, who's in um, academia. And the students were very clear to point out to me that they thought this approach of open resource was far more realistic um, in many of their nursing uh, courses was to 
learn where to find and how to interpret the information rather than just memorization. Thanks, Shannon. I think that's a really good lead in to the next slide of data that I will I'll share. I, I pulled my students and I tried to tease out what Shannon acquired from the verbal discussion that we had, that she had with her students. And I created a poll for my students, which they completed anonymously. And their data has been tabulated and I'll show that on the next slide, but I think it's important to just reiterate what Shannon was mentioning in that while I teach science that supports nursing and Shannon is a nurse who teaches nursing students the skills that they need to be successful, these modalities we've talked about, these methodologies that we've talked about, they are suitable for any post-secondary program. They truly are because in making assessments more authentic and more aligned with real world practice, the more students tend to be motivated and interested to do them. And I think before I show you the very impressive distribution of answers that I think my students gave me on the next slide, I think it's pertinent to iterate that I believe, and I think Shannon believes too, that the learning process isn't over when you acquire knowledge. It's, it's complete when you consistently use and you interpret and you apply that knowledge. I think we live in this digital age where a lot of people know where and how to find information, but there's such a deficit with learning how to evolve once you have that information, how to understand it and how to apply it, how to encourage critical thinking. And I believe that the ultimate test of growth for a student over a one year, two year, three, four year program will be, can you close the gap between recall and application? And this slide of data that I have right here, it was a select all that apply question that I gave to my students. So definitely keeping true with what I was preaching about earlier, they were asked to select the advantages of open book testing that most apply to them. I allowed them to choose more than one option. Going into this, my inference was that they were going to say reduced memorization was the biggest advantage to them. Their spread of results on this floored me. I had an 87% response rate from my students, which is very, very high. Most of them said the aspect that they liked most about open book testing is that it provided them with a second learning opportunity, which to me shows such maturity in their approach to the way they view an assessment when it's open resource, viewing it as a, just gonna try and dance around here to shed some light, there we go viewing it as a, a challenge and having that intrinsic motivation come forward to improve, steadily improve their performance. And those times and times again, where they are asked to retrieve, 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 it boosts their skill for retrieval practice. The more times they have to access a piece of information, the more they will become comfortable with using it. There are some other really good responses that they submitted with this too, echoing what Shannon presented before about reduced test anxiety. And also, of course, at the bottom, 83%, the development of critical thinking skills. Okay, so um, I just wanted to present a little bit of what we found in the literature. Um, Johans, Dinkins, and Moore from 2017 have a great uh, systematic review of their, um, what they did in their systematic review was specifically look at um, students learning of critical thinking skills. Um, and they, what they did was using some uh, themes, they captured uh, a comparison of the open and closed book to foster those critical thinking skills. This again, just being transparent about my bias is the systematic review was specific to nursing education. And what they found, um, which I, I was very um, satisfying because yeah. it's really what we have found is that um, the studies that were um, reviewed for the systematic review found that open resource or open book um, methods for fostering critical thinking skills uh, the open resource um, demonstrated more engaging in real world uh, application that tends to reduce anxiety and increase confidence in students. It was found to enhance critical thinking 
and problem solving skills. And that's a huge component of nursing curriculums is the problem solving, the clinical um, judgment and um, clinical decision making um, scenarios that we try to drive home concepts with. Equal results on both open and closed book for deeper learning. So it's not necessarily that you're you're demonstrating a deeper learning that was sort of equal uh, amongst the methods, that there were advantages to both, um, that the choice that uh, educators uh, choose to use, which methodology they choose, should be linked to the objectives. So the recommendations in this article in particular suggested that a closed book or open book um, methodologies were not always appropriate and to really try to link your choice of method with what you were really trying to get across to the students. Um, in, um, in their final sort of recommendation from their systematic review was that the, the highest or the um, best demonstration of higher learning and satisfaction and well-roundedness in the students was when educators actually used both um, methodologies together and sort of had a, um, a mix of methodologies in the one evaluation or conversely used open book and closed book throughout a semester. And then the last a recommendation was as a third variable to add collaborative testing because the collaborative testing worked really well with the open book um, methodology to also add the building of relationships um, into um, that evaluation. And again, we could do a whole other session on collaborating collaborative testing methods, um, but we just don't have time. So we'll stick to, to this for now. Shannon, I'm glad that you mentioned the piece about uh, striking a balance between closed and open book type assessments because Shannon and I do not mean to completely throw closed book testing by the wayside at all. Oh, we do see that there is a place for both and there's an ability, we believe, to strike a really beautiful and strong balance between the two. But there's a lot of finesse that I think needs to happen and a lot of practice, a lot of iterations before you can get there. Another example, um, I just wanted to find a, a, a present a non nursing example. So this was um, um, a comparison um, or a, it was an evaluation of a proctored open um, resource evaluation. And in this case, the educators, the open resource that the students were allowed to to um, access was the academic databases through their campus library. So all the other browser options on their computers were closed. Um, so they had some sort of um, uh, lockdown software uh, installed or downloaded, and the only access they had was to the academic uh, databases. And, and they were given one essay question, and they were asked to answer the essay question. Um, time was limited. And what they found was compared to uh, a similar um, assignment or test that they had used in previous years, um, where they had given um, students several short answer questions and had made it closed resource, that the students in this case gave a far more robust um, answer that students um, referenced several academic um, articles from from the journal databases and really demonstrated a far um, deeper understanding of the concepts that were asked. Um, what they did find that was time was a factor and that uh, students asked for more time to do an even better job. Um, and so time again is, is, is demonstrating to be a factor for, for my experience as well. Uh, so again, something to, to consider. We'd like to take this time to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your day to attend our session and having interest in the topics that we presented today. At the same time, we'd also like to acknowledge our colleagues who have helped us assemble some of the data and the slides in this deck, including Laura Killam, Rasha Wahid, and Tasha Sari.
Thank you so much for your presentation, Ryan and Shannon. Um, I found it really interesting um, the when the information came back from the feedback about the second learning opportunity for each concept. Likewise. Mm -hmm. um, so now we'll head over to the question and answer component of this webinar. Um, so the first question from anonymous attendee is, I find that one of the reasons that instructors lean towards MC cues is the automated marking a question for shannon how do you make it sustainable to transform your mcqs to discussion questions have you found a significant impact on the marking load that is a terrific question and the one that we get asked a lot um and it's not perfect as ryan mentioned it's not perfect um as I mentioned previously, multiple choice questions are what we rely on very, very heavily in nursing curriculums, um, because that's how, um, after they receive their degree, how they're registered and how they're um, evaluated to receive their registration. Um, so what I have done is I have not thrown MCQs out the window, like the baby's still in the bathwater in that perspective. So I use multiple choice questions um, sometimes, um, it, particularly if I'm teaching something that is praxis related or fundamentals, that type of situation, um, where open resource testing really lends itself is um, the higher uh, learning, a higher level um, of, the, of the curriculum. And in this case, nursing research is a seventh semester out of eight um, yeah course and so it's really much more effective in that level I do however um, start to use it a little bit in first year and build up as I go along uh, from a workload perspective a full transparency here it is a lot more work mm -hmm. um, but what I notice is because I don't have to worry about test integrity and test being compromised what I'll do is if I create a really great test that's open resource, I can use it year after year after year. And I really don't have to worry about um, the danger of that test being compromised. So yes, it's more work on the front end, but then becomes less work at the back end. Now, of course, you can also say, well, it's some more work to grade it, which it is. Um, if you're careful in your short answer questions and you really establish well for yourself what you're looking for in that answer, um, you can make it as painless as, as at all possible. But you're right, it is it is more work. Clarity is definitely key. Shannon raised a really good point with that. And even to echo what I had mentioned before, students, everyone actually in the digital age, we're so comfortable with finding information and students are really good at finding information, especially test banks from publishers that have been compromised and they're available on the internet. Thank you. Um, these are great examples and results. And I love the idea of open book. I'm wondering how much time it took to mark these type of tests versus the multiple choice closed book tests. Many faculty, especially other than full-time faculty, find marking to be a major time constraint. And that's from Trisha Boner. Thank you, Trisha. I think this follows up what um, the last question Agreed. Um, kind of followed up with. It does take more time. Absolutely, full disclosure. Um, I, I think it just, I think it depends on personal choice. And um, I think maybe I'm a bit of a glutton for punishment myself, so. Well, I can join you in that boat, uh, Shannon, but I think I, if I can add something to your comment, I find it is much easier to create an open-ended short answer or essay style question in terms of timing. It takes less time to do it. When you compare to looking at a multiple choice question where you have to look at the question, verify that the distractors are suitable, verify that the answer is correct. So there's a yin and yang to both sides, I feel. Uh, the year over year data for clinical chemistry is encouraging. Interesting that the same case study assignment average dropped significantly to 66% once individuals came back to class. What do you think was the variable that resulted in this drop? Was it because of the more in-person work? 
Yes, that is one of the reasons. And I think another one that I can address as well, and I did mention this very briefly earlier, is that year-over-year -year data is, of course, generated from different cohorts of students. And not all cohorts of students are equally strong in different subject areas. That is definitely one factor that's impacting this. But it's interesting that the group that I presented the most recent data for, where in the question that was just posed to me about how the overall average was lower than the previous two, it's interesting that that was pointed out because this group had their prior year virtual and it's where their prerequisites are assembled, right? But the group that I had the year prior also had their prerequisite year virtual and they did quite, their performance was quite solid, quite typical. So many factors do come into play. And I have found that the transition of moving from virtual and remote back to face-to-face -face learning has been a challenge for some students because the distractions that were available to them when learning virtually, whether it's texting or other distractions at home, I have noticed that sometimes it's difficult for them to shake those habits where even though they are face-to-face -face and they've been waiting for this, they've been waiting for this moment waiting to not be surrounded by distractions from home, getting an Amazon package delivered at the door or a barking dog or whatever it happens to be. And students are physically present in their chairs, but they're not mentally present because they're still distracted by things that they are bringing into the classroom with them. So it's been an interesting journey over the last three years for sure. I hope that's addressed your question somewhat. Yeah, thank you. And it'll be interesting to see um, over the next couple of years what happens. Like, do the dist distractions continue or do they mellow out? Absolutely. Uh, do you feel that open resource testing overall results in a solid foundation of grade? Absolutely. 100% yes. When the, the when you, the level of difficulty moves up the bloom scale so when your questions begin with um, virtually all of mine no pun intended there in clinical chemistry it's mostly interpretation so the questions will start with interpret apply or discuss like shannon gave an example of because those levels of cognitive ability are higher when students earn a B, they are proud of that B because they know what that B means to them. They know how much work it took to get that. So I do believe that it does consolidate the value. Shannon, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Just to say, I absolutely agree. Yep. Perfect. Uh, we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Um, fascinating that <laughs> students... <laughs> fascinating that students felt less stress and less anxiety because answers were available for them and that they were able to demonstrate a higher level of learning. This seems like open resource learning breaks down the gatekeeping of knowledge for students. Did you notice if students were able to verbalize their knowledge better, share in presentations, peer discussions? Uh, I'll go first and then Ryan, you can add. Um, I would say absolutely. Um, in my fourth year nursing students, for sure, uh, they have said to me after class, you know, wow, those questions were, were challenging, um, but it really, really forced us to think. And they were able to verbalize how much they had learned and, and how much they were willing or able rather to apply that knowledge in, in the clinical setting. So they actually were able to say to me, wow, you know, like I'm going to go back to the hospital now and, and this makes just a little bit more sense to me and I'm hoping I can apply the knowledge in that practical setting. Ryan? Absolutely. Thanks, Shannon. One of the things I've noticed that my students have shared with me anecdotally is when they have so many open-ended questions where they have to articulate an answer to me in their own words without plagiarizing, so to avoid any infractions of academic integrity, they say that going through that thought process is something that repeatedly, when they have to do it over and over and over, it's giving them, they're creating their own way of how to create their answers. And create is at the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy. And they always describe it in that way. They say, I'm learning how to create my answers for not just this class, but every other class that I'm taking. So 
the far reaching power of this, I think is, is pretty convincing and pretty strong. Yeah, for sure. Um, Dawn's asking from the faculty perspective, how much time can an instructor expect to spend on incorporating these kinds of assessments into their curriculum? Does it require a significant change in how they teach? Um, how have you supported your instructors with these changes? You start? Ryan, you want to tackle this? I, I would just, I um, I would, I would say, um, I would not say it's changed the way I teach. I, I, I'm teaching the content and the concepts very similar as I always have. Um, I think maybe, yeah, yeah, jump in, Ryan. I, I was just gonna say, I think um, it, it's purely in how I've evaluated them and of how I've uh, been able to measure how they can apply what I have taught them, but it hasn't really changed the way I teach them. Ryan, you have a different? Slightly different spin. I would say it hasn't changed the way that I teach, but it has changed the quantity of information that I teach because with an open resource assessment, I don't have to spend a lot of time going through the nitty gritty aspects of theoretical pieces of information for a given body system or given subject matter that I'm going through, because I know that they can look that up at any time when they need it, because I'm giving them the ability to do that. So that is one, that is where time has shifted, where less time is spent teaching those pieces of information and more time is spent, I would say for me at least, on the evaluation side. I would agree. Good point, Ryan. Thanks, buddy. Um, what, if any, micro or macro challenges have you faced um, with the open resource testing? Open resource testing is absolutely not invincible to infractions of academic integrity. I have had several students who have relied on the copy paste route over the last two years. It's happened more times than I, I care to state. And at Cambrian, we, like most in, in all institutions, we have a policy for that. And my job is to meet with the student to explain what the infraction was. That that has still occurred with this. However, most of those times when it has happened and a student has had a form filled out and they've had a meeting with myself, they've had a meeting with our chair or our dean, they've learned their lesson and they know that that's not the way to go most of the time. That's how it concludes. Have I had students who have made multiple infractions? Absolutely. Has it happened within the same semester? Yes. Has it happened within the same month? Yes. But those are minority cases. Those are not the majority of cases that I've seen. So that would be one challenge that I think has arisen with the ability to grab anything from anywhere and the temptation to copy paste. But perhaps Shannon has a different angle to spin. Well, I just wanted to add to that that a way that that's helped me sort of avoid that learning from having it happen yes. was being very, very specific in my instructions on the question. So you must answer this in your own words. If you use a source to help you answer the question, you must cite that source. You must provide a reference. Um, I will be you know, watching for academic integrity violations. So you have to be very in their face about what you're looking for and very, very specific. Yeah, that makes sense. I love the clear instructions and how you you set it up and obviously impacts the results. And that was definitely a lesson to be learned because up front, the first time you're trying it, I mean, you're never really sure you're going to get it right the first time. And then when you realize, I just simplify what I'm asking and make it a shorter question, Odds are it's not going to lead to as many conflations. Mm -hmm. um, what other ways could assessment be made to be more open? That's a really good question. Yep. Um, I think I could mention what um, we found in the literature was the collaborative um, option 
So an, another method you can use is providing the evaluative questions for the test. You leave the test open typically for a few days or a week, and you allow students to collaborate with other students to answer the questions. So that's another method um, that I know um, Laura has used here. Correct. And um, it is found in the literature. I have not personally tried it. Neither have I. But um, I think that would be also another assessment option. I can add another on top of that, actually similar, but in a slightly different way. I went to a conference many, many years ago, and one of the assessment strategies that was presented was something called two-stage testing, where a student would complete an assessment the first time, they would receive their grade back, and they would then have the ability to re-attempt the questions on a test after having the ability to reference a book, speak with their classmates, their, their classmates or their colleagues, and then reattempt the test to see if they could better answer open-ended questions than they did the first time around. So again, kind of running along the dialogue type route, that would be another way to make things more open. Yeah, wow, I love that. And then they get to learn and reflect on the knowledge twice or co-create with one of their peers. And Precisely. And that, Lutfi, exactly reflects what my students had selected in that poll was their, the second learning opportunity is what they valued the most. And with that two-stage testing example, the overall grade they would get for their assessment would end up being the average between their two attempts. So they wouldn't just automatically get the better grade that they got the second time, but it would just bridge the gap between the two. Mm -hmm. Although I'm sure faculty could award them the second grade that they received if they wanted. So a lot of flexibility with this. Yeah. And it's still, um, there's so much room to explore still. Absolutely. Um, so that concludes our test virtual webinar series. Thank you so much for your insights um, and coming today to present online. Um, I would like to thank uh, both of you um, for your work. Um, and I want to thank our audience as well. I hope you enjoyed today's session uh, and are going to join us uh, for the live stream events of TESS. Um, Jason's just dropping a link in the chat to those right now. Um, today's webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel in the coming days where you'll be able to access it um, and share it with colleagues if anybody missed out. Um, we also have a Slack channel for TESS. This is a great place to um, join in the conversation and really digest what you've learned today. So, Thank you, Lutfi. Uh, when I send you this finalized version of this slide deck, I'll include email addresses for Shannon and myself in case anyone would like to get in touch with us with any questions they might have. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to share nursing resources. If there's other nursing educators online, happy to share questions. Perfect. Yeah. Anyone can email us at um, communications at ecampusontario.ca and we're happy to put you two in touch. Deal. Thank you. Happy to do the same for the science piece too. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.